Hi, everybody. Grab a Bible, open it up to the Old Testament prophet Jonah. We'll get to the Gospel of John in a minute, but we're going to start with Jonah. The story of Jonah and the whale is one of the most popular Bible stories taught even in early Sunday school to preschoolers. The problem with most of the retellings of that story leave out a lot of the important details, such as it wasn't a whale, never says it was a whale, among others. God calls the Israelite prophet Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh and preach against it. Jonah chapter one, verse one. Now the word of Yahweh came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Nineveh was the capital city of the wicked empire, the Assyrians. The Assyrians were the global superpower of the time. They are evil. It was the Assyrians who invented crucifixion. Now, the Romans eventually perfected it centuries later, but it was the Assyrians who were depraved enough to dream it up as a means of torture and death. And God wants to speak against their evil and announce their destruction. Jonah ought to be excited for such an opportunity. God had promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 that he was gonna birth a new nation through him and God would be their God and they would be his people, his own treasured possession on the earth. And he says, whoever blesses Israel, I'll bless. And whoever curses Israel, I will curse. Well, Assyria had most certainly cursed Israel. And their time had come for God to bring about his righteous anger against them. So Jonah, in response to the clear and direct call from God, hops on a boat and goes the opposite direction. Jonah is in Israel. Nineveh is east of him. And he hops a boat to Tarshish, which is in Spain, directly west of him. That's the familiar part of the story. God calls up then a, a mighty storm while he's on the boat. To, and to calm it down, Jonah tells these pagan sailors, throw me into the sea into a watery grave. Jonah chapter one, verse 17. And Yahweh appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. And while he's there in the fish's stomach, Jonah recognizes his sin, prays a prayer of repentance and calls out to God for deliverance. You would too. Jonah chapter two, verse 10. Then Yahweh spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. God then repeats his original commissioning to Jonah. Go to Nineveh and cry out, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Oh, what a delightful moment for Jonah. He gets to be the one from Israel who announces divine punishment on wicked, evil sinners. They've been so mean. They have killed so many. And they are finally going to get exactly what they deserve. And Jonah gets a front row seat. But then... Nineveh repents of their sin from the king who sits on the throne all the way down to the slaves. All of the citizens hear the message of impending judgment and they repent before God of their sin. And God responds by forgiving them. He cancels the city destruction and they get to live. Again, what, what a cool moment for Jonah. He preaches an eight-word sermon and 120,000 people repent. I've been preaching for 25 years. <laughs> it's not a bad day for Jonah. Jonah chapter four, verse one. But this was a great evil to Jonah, and he became angry. And he prayed to Yahweh and said, Ah, 
O oh, Yahweh, was this not my word to myself while I was still in my own land? Therefore, I went ahead to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning evil. So now, O oh, Yahweh, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. God not killing 120,000 Assyrians is a great evil to Jonah. God's mercy is evil in Jonah's eyes. And it's only here in the last chapter of Jonah we find out the true villain of the story. I mean, that's the part of the flannel graph that you didn't hear about in Sunday school that we leave out for the kids. The Assyrians aren't the bad guys in the story. Jonah is the bad guy. He confesses, this is why I ran away in the first place. I mean, why is it that Jonah would hear this clear, direct command to go east and instead he goes west? Because he knew God is gracious and he is compassionate. He knew that God is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. He knew that God relents concerning evil and he did not want to see the wicked sinners of Nineveh experience that. So Jonah would rather die than see sinners forgiven. Jonah is not alone. He is joined by countless others throughout the centuries who trust God's mercy for themselves and resent God's mercy for others. Who does God love? Who does God care about? The biblical message of God's love is surprisingly controversial. Jonah is a, simply a product of his own time. God loved Israel. He had made that abundantly clear. He had promised it from the very beginning and he had stayed faithful through it all. Israel was God's people. But everybody else, well, why would God love them? They're not holy, they're not righteous. Why would God care? Turn to John chapter three. In John 3, we've been walking for the last couple of weeks through this incredible conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. This wealthy, powerful, influential, devoutly religious, spiritually dead Jewish religious leader. And Jesus has taught him, you must be born again. That there's nothing within him that he could do to earn God's love or earn God's approval, his soul is dead. His spiritual eyes are blind, he's in slavery to sin, and he is powerless to change that, he's hopeless. But God can release the captive. God can open blind eyes. God can raise dead souls to life. A power outside of Nicodemus must act upon him, enabling him to see, enabling him to believe, otherwise he's just going to remain in spiritual death. And how is that new life gonna come to him? to anyone for that matter. That's where we ended last week in verse 15. The Son of Man must be lifted up. The word that refers to his crucifixion, to his resurrection, and to his exaltation. And as the Son of Man is lifted up, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Jesus is going to die for sinners. And all of those, whoever they may be, all who believe in Jesus, who trust in him, will be granted eternal life. How amazing. How gracious God is. How loving he proves himself to be. But just how loving is he, really? John chapter 3, starting in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, 
but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds may be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been done by God. So let's walk through our text together, spend some time reveling in God's love and who he loves and how it is that he loves them. We're gonna have five points today. I know that's gonna throw everybody off, but don't worry, they're still alliterative. Number one, the reality of love. Our text opens with the most famous words in the entire Bible, and rightly so. For God so loved the world. Who does God love? God loves the world. How do we know that? Well, that's what it just said. He loves the world. And how is it that he shows his love for the world? Verse 16. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That, my friends, is very good news. Let's push some for greater clarity. God loves the world. And he's shown that by sending Jesus to the cross. So does that mean that God loves every single individual throughout human history in exactly the same way? The answer is no. The Bible is clear that God does have a kind of love that is absolutely for every single person in the history of the world. Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So the reason Jesus teaches us to love our enemies is because that's what our heavenly father does. He doesn't just love those who love him back. He loves even those who hate him. And what does that love look like? Well, Jesus said it looks like provision. God has the sun rise over the righteous and the unrighteous. There's not more sunlight on righteous homes than on unrighteous homes. God sends rain equally, thus providing life and crops. He, he doesn't distinguish between, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rain on this field because they're a, a good holy family, but I'm not gonna give rain to that field because they're unholy. Every person in the world has experienced that kind of love from God. Theologians call it common grace. He gives it to everyone because he is so absolutely loving. The Bible is also clear that God has a different kind of love for his own. Just as you love your own kids in a way that you don't love the kids down the street, your heavenly father has a special saving love that is only for those that he's adopted into his family. Psalm 103, verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. And as a father has compassion on his children, so Yahweh has compassion on those who fear him. There is a saving kind of love that is limited to those who are in Christ. And here's how we know that. God doesn't save everyone. 
40,000 people die every single day in our world outside of Christ. Every single person in the history of the world equally deserves his wrath and his judgment on their sin. So God is not unloving for not saving them. Everyone is, Ephesians 2, dead in trespasses and sins. Everyone is, Isaiah 53, all like sheep who've gone astray and turned to his own way. God could rightly never save a single soul. And that would never make him unloving. And yet, out of the mass of wicked sinners, God saves some. That ought to be jaw-dropping. By his mercy alone, as an act of sheer grace, the God who is love shows his love by granting new life to those who deserve only death. God loves the world, meaning he does not limit his love only to Israel, which is a radical idea for someone like Nicodemus. God doesn't limit his love only to those who are religiously devout and holy. Not at all. He loves sinners from everywhere, from every nation, from every people group, from every tribe, from every language. The gospel is not limited to some sliver of ethnic or economic or educational demographic. The gospel is for whoever, from wherever, God can save anyone. Number two, the reason of love. Verse 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. From his love, God sends his Son into the world, not for judgment, but for salvation. Now, does Jesus judge? Absolutely he does. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's be clear. The purpose of Jesus first coming into the world was for the expressed and determined purpose of our loving God saving people from all over the world. There is a second coming of Jesus into the world. That one is not for saving. That one is for judgment. But until then, we live today because God's love sent Jesus to the earth. Notice the emphasis is not on the love of Jesus for sinners. Though Jesus surely does love sinners, the emphasis is on the love of the Father for sinners. Some of you grew up with a picture of God that was warped. He was presented to you as cruel or vindictive and mean. You learned about God as a God who delighted in slaughtering the wicked. Now look, God is holy. God is righteous and he is rightly wrathful against sin and sinners. But at the same time, the God who is holy and righteous sent his son into the world to save those very sinners. So don't picture God as some cranky dad who's huffing around heaven. Then Jesus being so kind and so sweet and he came to the earth and died for us. So now, because of Jesus' work on the cross, he has twisted the Father's arm and now he sort of has to like you. I mean, Jesus died and everything, so he would look really bad if he didn't love you. No. 
God's love is not forced. God's love is not manipulated out of him. Indeed, this same Apostle John will tell us in 1 John that God is love. The cross did not produce God's love. God's love produced the cross. Number three, the results of love. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. God's love is so great that he sends Jesus to the cross to save sinners from every corner of the globe. And the result of God's saving love for his people is all those who believe in him are not judged. Oh, do you see the freedom in that? The Bible says that it's appointed to each man to die once and then to face the judgment. This fearful, trembling expectation of standing before the all-powerful, sovereign ruler, judge of all the earth, and answering for all my sin. How utterly terrifying. This is why people fear death. This is why people rebel against him. Because they don't want to answer to him, they don't think that they should answer to him. But those who trust in Christ are freed from all of that. We don't fear judgment because there's no judgment to come. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for every single sin you will ever commit. The punishment was placed upon him. He, he died your death. He, he took God's wrath. So now you, in Christ, get to go free. You've been forgiven. You can love him, not fear him. You don't have to be afraid of standing before him. You don't have to fear your absolutely impending death and what will come after it. You can welcome it as a dear friend who takes you home. But then there's the other half of this verse. He who does not believe has been judged already because of his rejection of Jesus. Several weeks ago, we fast forwarded from the early chapters of John into this text. And we looked at John 3.16 and a couple verses after that. I said that all at the same time, this is the most comforting verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world. I mean, how, how is that not comforting? That's amazing. And at the same time, it's the most terrifying verse in all the Bible. Whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish. Such good news. But that is good news because it is embedded in very bad news. You shall not perish if you believe in Jesus, meaning that perish is the default position. All those who do not believe in Jesus, that is the road they're on. That's where all of us start. No soul is a blank slate that stands before God innocent. All are guilty. All have rejected. And unless God intervenes by his love, you will simply remain under his judgment where you already stand. Number four, the rejection of love. Verse 19. And this is the judgment. That the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. And after hearing about God's great love in sending Jesus to the world to die for sinners like us, you'd think 
that people would respond with open arms. Yes, that's me. I'm a sinner too. Jesus died for me. I, I want to be forgiven. I want to be free of standing in judgment for, before God. I want to live right now with the confidence and assurance of eternal life in heaven. Bring it on. Yes, that's the, the offer of a lifetime. That's not what happened. John has already introduced us to that rejection of Jesus all the way back in chapter one, starting in verse nine. He said, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens everyone. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. The world did not know him. It came to what was his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. This is why the Bible is so helpful to us. It explains things. People reject Jesus. People claim God doesn't exist. People embrace false religions and the false hopes that they can earn some favor with God. Not because of intellectual reasons. Don't let those who reject Christ fool you into thinking that they're doing that because they're so smart. The reason people reject Christ is not intellectual. It is moral. The light has come into the world and man loved the darkness rather than the light. The light of the world has come to illuminate, to open blind eyes, but people did not want to see. They want to continue to sin in the dark for their deeds were evil, John says. This is the hard part of stepping out into the, out of the darkness of sin and into the light of salvation. Light shows you reality, what really is. It shows darkness for what it really is. It shines a spotlight on the depravity of sin and it forces us to see what it really is, what we really are. The light, verse 20, will expose dark deeds. Therefore, those who are in the dark hate the light. Those in the dark don't just reject the light, they hate it. They despise it. But wait a minute. Aren't we all in the dark? I mean, haven't we already established that all of us are dead in sin? That all of us are blinded to the glory of Christ? So if those in the dark hate the light and all of us are in the dark, how does anyone get to the light? Friends, that's the question of all questions. And that's the question that this entire chapter has been answering for us. Number five, the root of love. Verse 21, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been done by God. So we've already been introduced to this people group who practice evil deeds. They are in the dark. They hate the light. But now there's another group. Those who practice the truth. And they hate the dark. They love the light. They despise the dark. They come to the light. They welcome their deeds being exposed. They welcome the conviction. They welcome being cleansed. How in the world does that happen? Because I don't want to be in the dark. I don't want to love my wicked deeds and reject Jesus. I don't want to hate the light. I want to love the light. So how can any of us who are in the dark and hate the light start to love the light? I am glad you asked. There is only one way for such a powerful transformation of your affections. There's only one way to go from hate to love. You need a new heart. And that is exactly 
what God promised to his people in Ezekiel chapter 36, a text we looked at two weeks ago when we started in John 3. Through the prophet Ezekiel, God promised to do this powerful transforming work to cleanse his people from their sins, to put his spirit into them, causing them to obey, and to take out their hard heart of stone and replace it with a new heart. A heart that doesn't hate the light. A heart that now loves the light and hates the dark. So, how does someone go from death to life? How does someone go from hate to love? Well, go back to verse 21. Those who are practicing the truth, who come to the light, once they get to the light, what does it expose? It exposes their deeds, which are practicing the truth and coming to the light. It exposes that them practicing the truth and coming to the light has been done by who? God. Their deeds were done by God. Not you. Him. This is the one-two punch of John chapter three. This is exactly what Jesus has been teaching Nicodemus this entire time. You can't do it on your own. Only God can do this. He can give you a new heart. He can regenerate dead souls. And when he does, you will love him. When he does, you will believe in him. When he does, you will serve him. You must be born again. We don't know if the villainous Jonah ever got it, if he ever finally understood. God loves the world. He doesn't just love sinners in Israel. He loves sinners in Nineveh too. Not only can he miraculously regenerate dead souls in one nation, he can do that in all the nations. Jonah ends on a cliffhanger. We don't know the conclusion. We'll have to wait until eternity to find out if he ever came to understand God's love or not. But regardless of that, Jonah did know the truth of God's character. He didn't apply that truth very well at all. He did not respond to that truth very well at all, but he did know it. Jonah knew that Yahweh is gracious and compassionate. He knew that God was slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. He knew that God relents concerning evil that was true then, and that is true right now. You can know him. You can love him. You can be forgiven. You can be free from right judgment against your sin. You can be assured of heaven forever. Turn to him and be saved. He alone brings the dead to life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the glory of your love. It is overwhelming to us. It is beyond our capacity to understand that you have done this. And this has been the truth of your word from the very beginning. It was never about one nation. It was about the world. It was never about one people group or one kind of person. It was about the world. And the end of the Bible introduces us that at your throne, there is an uncountable number of people from every tribe and language and nation who come to you 
and worship you forever because you are the savior of the world. You love the world and Jesus came for the world. Thank you that you love everyone, that you care for everyone, because none of us deserve any of that. And then, for those who deserve nothing but wrath and judgment and eternal hell, you save some by your grace and your mercy. You awaken dead souls. You open blind eyes. You release the captive. And we're cleansed. We're forgiven. We're not just brought to life now. We're granted life forever. Thank you for your saving work. And as we do every week, we stop to remember it. We take a piece of bread and a cup of juice and we remember the saving work of Jesus on the cross. That your love compelled and fulfilled and ensured would happen so that now you can have a people from the world that are yours, who believe in you, who love you, who praise you. Thank you for making us a part of that. Thank you for Jesus. We remember him now. In his name we pray. Amen.